All right. Hi. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. How's it going? Good. It's going pretty well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Here we are. I guess we're on live. Uh, <laughs> it's the uh, live uh, event Thursday afternoons. Yeah, it's like almost snowing here. So, you know, everyone can just cozy in and, you know, watch us blab. Yeah, watch us talk on and talk on. Um, I guess we should say uh, uh, thanks to the CSC for having us do this. I think it's a very great initiative. And thanks to all the people who put it together, and Christina and Jeremy and the administration and all that. Um, so it's nice to it's nice to be a part of it because uh, difficult to sort of figure out what else to do sometimes in these days <laughs> definitely are you keeping yourself busy uh you know it's interesting we'll talk about it um some of the projects that i had upcoming are obviously postponed or pushed um but i've had a few sessions of script read throughs in in terms of prep for a project that i was meant to do here uh with the guys uh from uh, wildfire Oh, nice. uh, that's the short film that you shot and the feature that they're about to do. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's a prep process that we're having there for that. Um, so it's, it, uh, yeah, keeping busy well enough. I'm in Nova Scotia right now. I managed to escape out here. So it's nice to be home for a bit. So that's really good. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, same thing. I mean, it's been interesting. I was on like a TV show and we'd only been in one week of prep when the pandemic started. So they're still writing and sending scripts and stuff. So there's some prep work to do there. And then um, I kind of like had an idea that we have a movie club. So like the showrunner, writer, other DP, production designer, and I kind of once a week have a Zoom call and talk about a movie that we all watched you know, throughout the week, um, the same movie. We kind of pick a new one each week. And so that's been kind of fun. It's like a nice way to creatively touch base with a bunch of people that you're just starting to work with, even though you may not work with them for however many months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been doing a movie club with friends of mine in New York as well, where every week we pick a movie amongst the, the all of us and six of us every week. We Twice a week, actually, we talk about it. So it's really great. Oh, um, nice. All right, well, prep stuff is what we're meant to talk about. I think it's a really interesting part of this process that we get to do as cinematographers. I always remember, um, I had a, a cinematography instructor say that, you know, as a cinematographer, you're, a, you're three things, I guess. You're, a, you're an artist, you're a technician, and then you're a, a manager, and you have to cover that ground. And prep is where you kind of figure out almost all that stuff, because once you get into the throes of it, you don't have the time necessarily to come up with things artistically, I mean, within reason. Um, and the management has to be all set out because you haven't got the time, it's too expensive the time or it's too valuable the time rather to be figuring those things out. So prep is that time when uh, you have to eliminate all of that learning and stuff that you have to do and figuring out so that you're not wasting other people's time on the day. Yeah, I did a talk a while ago, uh, in December at the Whistler Film Festival and I found myself like on this panel, I just kept talking about prep. And I was like, what the hell, like what is wrong with me? I'm just like this prep, like maniac right now. Um, and I feel like it's just because I value it so much and the projects that I um, feel most proud of have had like very successful prep <laughs> processes. Um, so it's it's interesting, and obviously every every film is a different prep process as well, and every TV show and budget level it all kind of changes based on what you're working on. But it's so important to kind of have that. And you're right; it's like the time for me. It's always like the time that I also want to be able to like throw out all the bad ideas that you have um, or any ideas because when you're on set, it's almost like the first idea is the only one because you don't have time. So in prep, yeah. it's like to be able to kind of throw an idea one day and then two days later come back to it and be like, no, that's not it, you know? Yeah, yeah. 
I think that's really interesting. I'm, I'm, I'd be interested to hear about that. I think maybe just at the top here, what I'll do is I'll just sort of, Catherine and I talked already a little bit about what we're gonna go through today, just so everybody can kind of get a sense of where we're going. So it doesn't sound as though we're just gonna bang on about, you know, reading scripts and, and making notes on the back of your script pages. Um, we thought we'd talk about, you know, what it is, how we read a script first a little bit, how we sometimes we interview for the job and how that's kind of the beginning of that relationship with prep and then reading the script through with the, the heads of the, well, with the creative uh, heads, like director and production designer. Then we'll go into shot listing a little bit and then some, maybe some previs pre or specialty stuff that will come up that you have to prepare for. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how, I, I'm super interested to hear about how you choose cameras and lenses and what, how you include other people in that decision. Cause I do it in an interesting way where I talk to the camera vendor and those people I trust and kind of hear what their thoughts are. Cause I, technology is always evolving and those people are on the front line for it. And I, I find that super inf informative. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about working with crew in prep, how to sort of choose crew, who we, who we sort of, uh, how we interview people a little bit, or maybe more about how we work with those people in terms of our early prep before we start principal. Uh, maybe a little bit about lighting diagrams and shot listing. Uh, and then an interesting part, which I think is interesting, is setting up a color workflow and doing some LUT work a little bit. Because um, every time I do it, it's different because I'm always trying to learn and do it the, yeah. a way that works for me. Oh, and I think we should talk about camera tests and lens tests and hair makeup tests. I think that's interesting, too, because yeah. that's, uh, that's another job that we have to put together to help other departments figure some of their stuff out so that we can all work in the same place. All right, so with that, that's the kind of rundown of where we're going to hopefully get to in this uh, session. Um, all right, so. <laughs> How do you first read a script? Oh, some, it's interesting. It's different. Sometimes I read them really quickly and I try not to think of any notes and sometimes I make notes. Um, but oftentimes what's strange for me is in the early parts of getting uh, getting into a job, you send a script and they say, hey, you want, to, uh, you're going to talk to the producers and directors tomorrow or, you know, in two days. So you only really get a chance sometimes to read the script once. Um, and so it's, it's odd. I tried then just to read it and then just absorb the material and think about what it sort of means and how I feel about it, rather than getting into the nitty gritty of like, oh, we should do a little push in here or what the sort of action, like more, it's more global about, it's more about the script and what the story means. And then that will, that will blossom into visual conversations with people. Yeah, I'm similar. Like I, in an ideal world, I do two reads of a script before even talking to a director or producer about it and one of those reads is just clearly just the story reading the the, the the script and not thinking about anything visual technical anything i mean obviously those things kind of creep in because you can't help it but uh trying to do it without that and then do a second pass where you start throwing in some ideas that you might want to bring up to a director and yeah yeah um and a lot of those notes I do early on, I, uh, after that, after that first read, but as I start to go through the script after that, um, I generally keep a, it's difficult because you always get page revisions. I'm always so annoyed that in the beginning of prep, sometimes they, they do, oh, we did some revisions to the script. Here's a whole brand new one. Because <laughs> well, all of my notes are that. on, all, all, no, no, well, not that, but uh, more that all of my notes are on the page. So if they give me a new set of script pages, they give me a whole new script, then I go, oh, all of my notes are on there and I still haven't figured out the system by which to sort of be able to have those transfer because it all shifts but um, I am trying to switch over to the digital world because I'm like a person that carries around like a giant binder of stuff and so now I've been switching over to doing it all on an iPad where there's programs where your notes will automatically switch over to new drafts so I'm only in the beginning stages of doing that but it's kind of nice because it also gives me the opportunity to kind of in different colors as well do different passes of notes so whether oh, that's, that's like I do a path that's like my original ideas and then the next time I go back maybe it's a pass of ideas I've talked to the director about and then maybe it's a pass that's just here's lighting notes here's camera notes whatever yeah oh great 
So I'm hoping that I can, uh, you know, not be a dinosaur and actually that will work for me. <laughs> I've, I tried the digital method and bought, you know, the iPad with the pen and I try that now at least early on to save paper, but I still will do, I started doing a miniature script, the, the same as like a set of sides, which I use now for my set script because I am all, always have the script on set, my own script, uh, because I'm always conscious of what scene was just before this. How did we get to where we're going? Where do we have to get to? So that it's not just here's a scene, here's a scene, here's a scene. It's actually the, yeah. the overall arc of things. Um, I have a question for you about like, if you're going into sort of interview for a project, do you prepare visual materials? Because this is like a question that I've had. I'm so curious to hear other DPs answer because I've, I've rarely done that. A couple times I have kind of knowing that that's what they expect out of an, out of the interview, um, and I'm you know I'm not a designer, so I'm like doing a, like a treatment in like Google Slides or whatever. Um, but it's also like I don't want to plant too much information in there before even having an initial conversation with the director. So I'm kind of a little hesitant to go in like too strongly sometimes, but at the same time. Sometimes it's nice to kind of bring that. And I know like as a production designer, they'll come in with like a full package of, you know, what they think for the film. I, uh, I know exactly what you're saying because I think the same thing. I'm like, oh, maybe I should be doing that book. And I think it's great to do it. And I've heard people have great success with doing a book or doing a little presentation, something like that. But early on for me, I get into that later because I've only read the script a handful of times in my own little bubble and someone else has either written it or been preparing it or in, in you know, developing it for a long time. So I would, sometimes I feel a little bit, um, it feels a little presumptuous. I always remember that quote from that um, uh, documentary, cinematographer's documentary where they do all the interviews and I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head right now, but where somebody's talking about that idea that you wouldn't want to go into an interview and say, the whole thing we're going to do black and white and handheld and then they go well actually we were thinking more yeah. like static and dollies and color and so you you don't want to come in too hard you, and so you have to seem flexible and open to ideas but i actually get into you know the visual arc of things with people a little bit later because then you get to kind of in a way the interview for me is also interviewing the director a little bit trying to see if there's somebody i feel i can collaborate with and, and and, and see what their thought process is so that I can get in line with it. Uh, and so I don't often come in with a lot of, uh, of those kinds of things. I'll mention them as the conversation goes. Yeah. Oh, it makes me think of this or that sort of thing when I read it, but uh, it's a, be a lot of work to sort of have to go through and do all that stuff. What, you know, and so what I was saying earlier about these sort of Zoom days, the first thing I do or try and do when we finally get to prep after the, the, the you know, when I finally am on the job is very early on in that process, uh, two things. One, I try and get to as early as I can in on the scouting process. And the other thing is what I did the other day, which was sit down with the production designer, the director, sometimes a producer, uh, a creative producer, not rarely an editor, but anyway, but those sort of key creative heads and we read the script together, we just read it. And we stop at any point and talk about anything. And that's when all the ideas, like you said, you put all the ideas out and kind of pushing around the table and being like, oh, I kind of like this one. I kind of like that one, or I was thinking this. And so that gives you the, the meeting of all those sort of ideas and minds. I find that very useful. I like that. I, I actually like haven't really had that experience, but I like it. Like, I've only had that experience when it's almost a little further down where you get to kind of like a, a larger production meeting version where everyone's sitting in. But um, I like the idea of bringing in a production designer into those conversations early on and producer. But for me, I often like, I, and it, it's almost been like every film I've done, it's not TV at all, but for films, I have like really, really pushed and carved out time to sit with a director and go through the entire script, just having them explain to me the emotional beats of the script. So like, where do yeah. you find the value? Where is, 
where, because sometimes it seems obvious to a director or a writer who's been like sitting with that script for forever. Um, and I want like the obvious stuff explained to me. I want to know what scene they value, um, a character feeling a certain way. And I hope that like all those emotional conversations kind of like stick in the very base of prep going forward. Um, and I've kind of, I've done that for like the last few films and I, I really enjoy it. It also gives you, me a time to kind of spend time with the director and start to build like that relationship and trust and just get who they are, what they like, what they don't like, when, you know, how they act when they're hungry, uh, like all these things that kind of, when you get on set, it actually helps to kind of know and have uh, that shorthand. Yeah, that's true. It's hard because um, it's a luxury of time, right? And you, for me, I'm like, I would take more time over anything in prep, you know, like that, that time of spending time with the director and really building a bit of a relationship is so valuable to me. It's, it's, it's hard that time too. I find myself in prep. I have to, um, um, I have to uh, sort of almost fight for that time. The directors are so pulled in all directions. Uh, on larger movies, especially, I think on smaller movies, we're a little bit more tight and a little bit more core and things sort of happen very slowly. And then just as you're about to shoot, they kind of go. Um, yeah. But on larger films, I've experienced where um, the directors are, they're casting, they're getting pulled out for this, they're getting pulled out for prop show and tell, they've got to do this, they've got to be online with the producers in LA. So, so you, uh, you I, that time is valuable. And I find that I have to, I'm the one that has to sit down and say, every day at this time let's just do an hour or yeah. an hour and a half or i'll sit in your office and you kick me out if you need to have a private conversation but whenever you have spare time let's just do this because um otherwise it gets kicked down the road and i, I sometimes regret not having had more time it's true you do have to kind of like speak up for that and i find sometimes in the bigger version of a yeah a bigger budget movie sometimes those things they're not going to be scheduled for you you know you have mm. to say I need this time with the director and yeah every day uh, an hour or between these scouting things I want that hour and, and then that starts to go into a pre-pro schedule because um, it doesn't just happen <laughs> yeah I, I, I did this great thing I started doing this great thing on the movie Maudie I did in uh, Newfoundland uh, with this lovely director, Ashton Walsh, who's an Irish woman who's excellent. And she, we were prepping uh, in uh, St. John's um, and um, the production uh, had taken this old school as production offices, as we always do as a film company. We're always finding places to kind of repurpose into production offices there. And so we were kind of, as we were looking at the layout of rooms and everybody was kind of being sort of given an office, the director said, why don't you and me and the production designer and the art director all just share this giant classroom together. I'll have a desk here, you have one there. And so we, that was us, that gave us all the time to talk. Because I value a production designers, I because they're the ones who are working ahead and, and I want to be in their head. I want to know what they're doing and they should know what I'm doing. And, and so they are a uh, absolute peer to me. And um, so it was nice to be in the same room. We sat in the art room and that's how we prepped the movie. Nobody had yeah, phones on the desk because so you didn't need faster. to call anybody. Yeah, things happen so much faster when you're there and you're kind of going through things and then you can just go, hey, what's up with that thing? What about that? Like those conversations happen so much faster when you're all in the same space. That's nice. Yeah, and, you, and, and, you, and we, all the art goes up on the, because we, we print out all your reference photos, you know, as you go through and you pick up reference photos. And I do this thing, um, every movie I started this kind of habit. When I can, I sort of go to, there's this one little sort of tiny boutique, um, independent photo book store in New York called Dashwood Books. And I started doing this years ago. I would go and spend an afternoon there before I started a movie. And I would go through books and find photo reference, find a book that I just felt would be, this is my reference book, you know, for this movie. Um, so I have a whole collection of those books per movie. You know, that movie was a Saul Leader color book that I had. And this one's a, some bizarre Scandinavian photographer. And, and then we would have a table in the, in the office with your sort of photo references. Do you do photo references or things like that at all? 
I do, and I find that uh, books are kind of like invaluable to me because looking at a photographer that you like online doesn't really give you the same thing. It gives you like the greatest hits and that's not really necessarily what you want. So getting a photographer's book and sitting there and going through it really, I find kind of opens it up. I'm actually like sad now because I brought a bunch of books to our production office for the show. And then when it shut down, we were like, yeah, we're gonna be on hiatus for two weeks. I left them all there. So there's like a stack of photo books sitting in like a warehouse studio near the airport uh, held hostage now so oh no <laughs> but I yeah. do find I, I do photo books and then what I'll often do too whether it's like well it's from the very beginning it's from reading the script is like I usually have a Dropbox and I'm just dumping photos and references in there and I'll share that with the director uh, production designer or whoever kind of wants to be a part of that that's a very common thing I, I've, we've done on a number of films now it's just and I'm, I just for a note for everybody, I, I haven't really done any TV show. Uh, Catherine's done a, a number of TV shows, but I, uh, I'm mostly speaking from a sort of feature film, independent film kind of uh, background. Um, so Catherine will be able to fill in a little bit of the variations in terms of the TV world. But Dropbox, we do this common Dropbox where everybody has access and I get my little folder and like my location references and there's location pictures and set designs. And so it's that one common place. Uh, I do that as well. Oh, do you have go-to you know you go references? Oh, for definite. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, I've had that. <laughs> I referenced a couple of movies, probably for like five years, just because I sort of was so adoring of the of that vibe, and it felt like it spoke to me. You know, um, I'll mention them. I have no problem saying what they are. Like uh, for a long time. There's this great independent movie called Hide Your Smiling Faces, which these, these young guys in New York made, it must be almost 10 years ago. It's very Lynn Ramsey rat catcher. And so I would always use that. It's one of my go-tos actually. Is it really? <laughs> rat catcher. Oh. rat catcher. oh, rat catcher, yeah. Yeah. Because you're always in that that process and, and um, it is like a movie, it's very great. It's a very visually uh, subtle movie, very quiet movie, very rat catcher. But it's also unique and people are like, oh, I've never heard of that. And so you kind of feel a little bit like, oh, it's cool. <laughs> it's like you mentioned something, it's just a little trick. But yeah, I um, have felt actually like during this pandemic, I am trying to go back and look at like older films and some other stuff because I find it's really easy to just like glob onto like these new references. And I don't like that like all of us as DPs have like the same references all the time. So mm -hmm. I have been trying to kind of like dig into Criterion and Mubi and like see some more foreign, independent, older stuff and, and you know, just re-up in the reference world with something new. Yeah, that's true. Actually, it's a good question. Uh, there's a question coming in from Chris here asking about whether we use Shot Deck, um, oh, yeah. which is interesting because we talked about this the other day briefly. Um, Shot Deck, for those people who might know, um, is very new. I think it's in beta. It might be still sort of invite only. It might be sort of like still trying to get its legs a little bit. Um, you may know more about it. Uh, uh, no, no, it's, it's run by Lawrence Shear, who is the DP of uh, Joker. I think he started it. And so it's a database of images all from films. And it's just like really well organized. So you can kind of go on and go, um, I want to see exterior, night, blue, like there's these keywords and it'll pull up all these images. So I find it really, really great. It actually like the one time, the last project I did, I did do a bit of a lookbook and I found it to be like super time saving device. Cause you're like, oh, I need right. this apocalypse moment. And then you can kind of put in these keywords and then you're going through and finding the stuff that speaks to you. I mean, I still think that like it will, hopefully it can expand to, to include more films so that we're again not all referencing like the same ones that come up at the top which yeah, is like yeah, yeah. Joker and her and Tree of Life and <laughs> all all of Warren Shear's movies <laughs> no <I'm just> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but no um, I think it's super helpful I, I just, I, I, you have to have like multiple go-tos like if I just used that I think my reference pool would be too stale so it's like using that and using photos and art and you know is kind of where is a happy place for 
It's some of a lot of things. I think references are super good. I, I had a look through Shot Deck recently because I just sort of start. I just got into it, I think, in January. And I, and um, so I looked through it. And I thought it was a great resource. I haven't had the opportunity to use it uh, that much yet. But it, photo references are so useful to develop that shorthand. It's almost like, you know, cliches aren't a bad thing because it gets you somewhere fast. If you need to describe something, it's like, okay, here's a reference of how what I'm sort of talking about. It doesn't mean let's do it exactly like this, but it's a piece of that sort of like, here's kind of what we're thinking, but let's apply it to our world and then we'll mix in a little bit of that. So photo references, I think are super interesting to build as, a, as a, an entire sentence and not just one word, if that's a good analogy. Yeah, I find it interesting because we like live in this world where we're on Instagram and we're looking at photos and we're looking at all these still images um, which are super valuable and give you that feeling and that mood, but it's so funny that we often are not actually like expanding that to look at the motion of the camera and what is happening in a lot of those images. Um, right. You know, especially on Instagram, you see people, and I do too, we post our, our images of a film that we've worked on um, and you don't see how that actually like moves and how it feels in the scene. So, you know, it is a good reminder too to kind of like go back and actually look, watch films, <laughs> watch how these yeah. things move, watch what those images look like moving and how they cut to the next image um yeah it's, it's more so funny on my, uh, my pandemic to do like homework you know <laughs> it's funny you do often sometimes sort of forget to think about that i've i've been guilty of like watching a movie on a weekend and then on monday showing up on set and be like hey i was thinking about this cool little dolly back thing you know <laughs> but you, it, you get it, so yeah um one other thing i'll mention and then i want to talk about um how you shot list and that process, how you go through that um, in terms of a prep vibe sort of thing. I started doing this thing a couple of years ago. It doesn't work for every movie. I I've tried it on other movies, but we were doing a very, it was, it was this movie called Giant Little Ones, which was about teenagers and, and uh, um, sexuality and that kind of exploration of the definition of love, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I'm a sort of, you know, Try, always trying to create a central vibe or some sort of like touchstone for all the creatives. Not, I'm not trying to create, but I'm trying to find that for everybody. So we did a shared playlist of music, yeah. which I thought was, uh, it was very useful in that movie because I just said, here's a shared post. You know, everybody can put tracks on whatever music you feel sort of is you like and you kind of attach this movie maybe and so it became this playlist that I would just listen to in the office put my headphones in and do some type in the playlist we go through about 30 songs and it I think it's also something I would listen to on the way to work in the morning just to get myself back on the same page maybe I was tired or something like that but you get kind of tonally back into that same vibe of how the movie's supposed to go so you're not just to try and keep you on a you're trying to make a movie over 30 days or 25 days or 20 days to keep that same tone throughout to at least uh, keep yourself straight. That yeah, that's sense. cool. Yeah, that's amazing. I, uh, doing Firecrackers, um, Jasmine, the director, she had kind of, she was working a lot with the actors in prep to kind of get them into these characters and they were going very deep into character work. So they had shot, they had um, some playlists, a playlist as well that they shared with me that was kind of like music that the characters would listen to, uh, which I, which was really helpful actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it was a, it was an interesting, it doesn't necessarily work on some movies, and, but, but uh, I thought it was good. Yeah, that's great. Um, shot list, <laughs> how does that work for you? Um, it's I such mean, a, a time consuming thing, whew. It is. I mean, I try to do it and I have successfully for the last features that I've done, we've done like full shot lists of every scene. Um, it is like a slog. It is something that you are like every day again, like we need to have another hour together. We need to do this. Um, I sometimes find it really difficult. Like we, you know, you have a producer or a specific scene and it's like where they're asking you, can you give us a shot list for this? And you don't have a location yet. You're like, yeah, exactly. You know, like for me, shot lists are so dependent on location. And in the ideal prep world, like going back to those locations 
with the director and spending time shot listing in the locations is like the best way to do it. That is like a luxury that you don't always have, like having access to the location isn't always a thing. Um, I did do that with Firecrackers and also with a film we just did, I just did called Clifton Hill, not every location, but we did go back and, and Albert, the director and I would spend like an hour or two in a space um, and kind of shot listed out and even photo board sometimes um, stuff. So that, that I find like the best because you want something where the camera is like moving, especially people who, if you're going for a style where there's like a longer take and it's more about blocking of actors and it's not just about coverage, that is like so spatially dependent. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. that, but that's a real luxury. <laughs> it is, it is uh, uh, small movies, always difficult to get uh, locations locked down. Even in, even you start shooting, you don't have some yet. And even on larger movies I've done sometimes, it's like, oh, you're right down to pr just pre-tech scout before they actually kind of now down. So you don't have that luxury of sitting. I would love to do that, of sitting in a place and and talking it out. Um, I've Shot lists I've done, it takes so much time. Um, and it generally, it's interesting for me, shot lists turn a little bit more into, for me, making sure we note what's important to get in a scene. Because shot list, I mean, you could go and you could say, okay, scene 22, we'll do a wide, we'll do a close there. And then it just turns into wide, close, wide. medium, <laughs> insert. And, then, and you could just kind of almost in a way, it's not really this way, guys, but you could almost just sort of like copy that. And if someone says, can you have a shot list? It's like, here you go. <laughs> because you don't necessarily <laughs> know. It's a bit unfair. It's a bit unfair. But, um, but I think in the shot listing process, what I've started to do is make notes of how we want the scenes to connect, especially if there's some kind of connective match cut or something so that you have those notes that are important. Knowing how complicated a scene is to be for certain reasons. So maybe we need a little bit more material. Maybe we wanna do something in one, all those creative things, but without necessarily locking down. And I have done it too, where, uh, where we've had overhead drawings and we do maps of camera positions. But what generally happens a little, quite often, I think, in that situation is, um, uh, is that uh, you show up on set and then the actors go, oh, I, I, I want to do over here. And you go, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you're not going to be like, uh, no, no, no. You're going to do it over here. It's like, they want to do it a different way. And then you go, so a shot list to me, I've always described it this way as you, you note all these things down, you have the idea and you have that plan, but it's ready to go away. But at least you built what I call the filter, which means whenever something else happens, you can refilter it through the ideas and adjust the course rather than be like, oh shit, now I don't know what to do. Well, I think, yeah, that kind of goes back to to me wanting to do that like emotional beat pass because you do the shot list and then you're there and things change on the day. And you're like, you you know, I want to go back to why did I want to do that shot? Why was, what right. was the motivation in the scene? What are the important things? And so, so when all the shit hits the fan and your shot list and your plans for the day go out the window or you have to start cutting things or whatever, you kind of know what the core of it is and what you want to do. But I agree. It's funny, like how many times you kind of like plan a whole shot and then you get there and the actors are like, yeah, I was going to go over here and do this thing. And, you know, you have to kind of weigh it when it's worth fighting for something. Like if it was something very complex yeah. and it was something that you and the director really want, it's like when you, you got to weigh and kind of test the water scope, what the, the vibe is of like, when do you push to actually get them to do that stuff? And when do you collaborate with the actors and respect that that's how their character would do it. That's what they need to do. Um, and sometimes they have better ideas or they want to do something that, you know, creates sure. something way nicer on set. And so, you know, for me, that's always like the thing is like, I love, love, love prep. And then I'm, I love being on set and like happy accidents, throwing it all out the window and like finding something new that works on the day. Uh, I think that's the best too, because often those new things you found and you and you have the opportunity if you're ready for it to follow are better than the things you could have come up with yourself anyhow, somehow. Anyway, um, that said, um, um, the uh, there is a very much required section of uh, shot listing which involves 
big plans for, for at least that, that I've experienced, specialty sequences like big VFX sequences or big stunt sequences. Often, sometimes they'll get previs. Sometimes you'll have to do a map. I did a film last year where we had this, it, the whole end of the movie takes place with somebody in a house in the dark. <laughs> You know, like sneaks into the house, no lights are on, that kind of uh, scene where you're just yeah. like. Um, and uh, it's the whole ending of the movie and it involved guns and six characters and a staircase and a stunt and special effects and visual effects and all those sorts of things. So we actually hired a storyboard artist to map it all out and sort of had that uh, ready to go. So it was a little bit more planned. Um, yeah, I, yeah, those, you know, sometimes you have to do that and, and you know that many departments are relying on that. Um, I saw that like a lot in TV as well. If there's like a complicated sequence or a VFX sequence, you have a VFX team in post, you have like the onset effects team, you have all these people who kind of do need to know what the shot's going to be as much as you yeah. want to be like, yeah, we'll find it on the day. Like, I just want a free flow. It's like, yeah, you do have to commit sometimes and have those shot lists there. We, and for Clifton Hill as well, we had like this whole sequence with a tiger. Um, and oh. that was like a huge undertaking. As much as Tiger King makes you think that there are tigers around, just <laughs> like, yeah, right. in Canada, I guess there's not as many. Um, but just getting a tiger into like a space and how much time we had with the tiger and people and the thing, it was like, it had to be quite planned out. Um, so, you know, that was something where we had shot lists from very early on that we had to kind of stick to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's a question here from James asking about how much time is allowed on set for discovery. Um, I think, I don't know how you feel about that. It depends on how you allow, uh, how you've built it to allow yourself to discover uh, what's on set. I mean, I think you have your plan, but I always sit in on blockings and, and watch and I'm just constantly calculating, okay, well, if that happens, okay, this is, so you're building it, the idea to try and get through it efficiently because you're not gonna get a lot of time to do a lot of discovery, but it really depends on the project. Sometimes it, that's how it is and people understand that you haven't been given the, the head start in order to not have to do a little bit of discovery, but it's definitely, a uh, scary thing to sort of watch it once or twice and then commit to the plan and then get halfway through and go, ooh, well, better get way around. Uh, do, do, you, do you feel you have much time to discover much or, or, or what's the time frame for you? I think it depends on the set and the way a director runs the set, the way an AD runs the set. Um, I think for me, there's certain scenes sometimes with a, that I'll know we want to carve out time for um, to kind of play with a little bit on set. Uh, and I'll try to give an AD a heads up, like, especially if you have a schedule in a day and you're like, this is a crazy day. So this scene here, sorry, it's not that important. We know what it is. We're going in, we're pounding it off. This is a shot. We have it planned out, done. Then this one, we need the time. We need time to play. We need the time to, you know, and that's just with the director as well, giving them space to like have time with the actors, because sometimes that's a huge thing. Is if it's an emotional yeah. scene, you know you're going to need the time in there to like get people comfortable to get things rolling properly. Yeah, it's true. You always you're always protecting your time, but you're also protecting the director's time with the actors and the actors' time too. Not that they can't fend for themselves, but I'm always trying to be very conscious of that as well. Yeah, it's um, hard. It's like a, a part of our job that's like the not fun part is like we do we are somewhat responsible for making a day. Um, so you know, especially in TV, it's like there were times where for me, I was like, oh, but I want to do this thing and that thing. And you see all these like little extra moments and sometimes there's not time for those extra moments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it can be heartbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I also, there was a question about politics and uh, conversations with producers of honesty and how honest you can be. Um, which is interesting, like, again, another not fun part of our job is like the managerial, the sort of like, the not create, it's not as creative. Um, Balancing all of the limitations, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm a really bad liar. 
<laughs> as like friends of mine who we had a zoom date of playing mafia the other day and they were like uh we know it's you um like i'm i'm really i it reads on my face i think and so i'm not really great at like kind of playing games with producers i'm pretty upfront and i think that's sort of my tactic um <laughs> i do find support from crew like especially on bigger stuff that like a, a gaffer and a key grip will be dealing with producer um a lot more so sometimes they're the ones that are kind of able to wrangle things in a different way whether that's time or money or whatever um better than i can <laughs> how about mm -hmm. you yeah. I'm, I'm not a very good negotiator i'm like okay so <laughs> I, you know, there's part of me that's always like trying to sort of, uh, you know, keep people happy. And so I'm not necessarily the first person to jump into shooting a really straight, hard conversation to have, but I've learned that uh, through the years to, to just be honest about it and not be too, not sort of go, okay, I'll just, I'll just figure it out on my own. Like if there's an honest conversation needs to be had with a producer about our capabilities, somebody needs to sort of say it. otherwise we're all fooling ourselves a little bit and we're all going to go down for it i learned that from a, a, a producer a long time ago a good producer on a music video we we're scouting something and the director was going okay we'll have somebody in that building over there and this over here and then we'll do this thing and then we'll do that and it was all night and all this stuff and i was going uh oh and the producer stepped in because he knew and he said um to the director he said this is beyond our scope for this job. We're going to have to think it's another thing to do. Like we, 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 we're not, we're going to drown. And so I don't put it that way, but I definitely will put it out there. This is an interesting thing that I try and do is anytime I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to make a call or decision or create a decision, I sort of make it a group decision to go for something um, or not go for something because, um, if we try something that I've pushed for, you know, that whole, that whole thing was like, I need a techno crane or whatever it is, that, that weird gift that came out 12 years ago or whatever. I need, if I was to demand a techno crane and then it shows up and it's the wrong piece of equipment, they all look at me and go, oh. So I try and involve everybody in the conversations of saying, this could be something that gets us through it. What do you, th what do you think? How, so that everybody makes a decision yourself. So if it goes right, we all did a great job. And if it goes wrong, we all kind of go, okay, well, it didn't quite work out. So it's it's a tough one to be honest, but it's so important because otherwise you'll get caught standing there in the middle of a set uh, at a standstill. Um, what do you think here? Oh, how early do you, I said earlier that I try and get into scouting as early as I can, or at least into prep. I've done a thing where you'll get, you'll get often you'll get given five or six weeks of prep on a larger film, maybe, maybe more depending on the movie. Sometimes they'll try and say, okay, well, we can only, on an indie movie, we can only do three, three and a half. If I've been given four or five or six weeks prep, sometimes I'll say to them, when does the designer start or when does the director start prep? Um, and I'll ask to take one of my weeks and put it to the very beginning. So I'm there very early in early conversations so that they're not, waiting to have me come in having decided a whole bunch of things and then i come in and i'm kind of like trying to catch up with everybody um, that's a good that idea, also, yeah. also it also involves getting out on some of that early scouting so you can have influence to talk about oh this location oh it could be great or this would be trouble or that maybe this and so another set of another set of input there yeah i i mean for yeah scouting is key i love that idea actually i no, i want to do that with the breaking up the prep and being there a little earlier it's you know the tv series that i was just starting you know they had all been working for like a, over a month um and the production designer for a few months so when we came in as the, the dps they were like we have all these questions and there were like all these technical questions and like builds of sets and all this stuff and it's like this is my yeah. first day i don't hey yeah. uh you know, and you're already in there doing like reads and scouts and all this stuff that was like, oh, okay. Uh, I need to like get more more of the the base before I can answer all these things. So that would have been a good yeah. Uh, approach. Yeah. 
Yeah, or some some sort of version of getting in a little earlier. I just hate being kind of behind because it's like everybody's on chapter seven of a book and I'm on like, the first 10 pages and it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh shit. Um, let's see here. Um, do you have, do you, have you done much stuff for it? I, oh, I have a document I could share about a movie in terms of prep and shot listing. Um, I did a movie last year, which was, let me see if I can just find it really quick here, um, where we had, we had uh, something like, let me count the, the days, the pages here, 48 driving scenes. 48 driving scenes that were all somehow different in a different version of a car, uh, same car, different car, trucks kind of things. And some of them were fast, some of them were, some of them were two eighths of a page and some of them were, you know, eight pages. And so um, we didn't previous that, but we definitely, I definitely had a technical day with the car where I, um, we, I, I had the grips in prep do all the car rigging. We had the car come over. We did every possible. We rehearsed the car rig. Wow. And I've done I've done days on movies with a lot of car stuff. We're like, oh, we're doing that car day. And it showed the trailer shows up at 5 a.m. and the grips get a two-hour pre-call and the car gets on. And no, to nobody's fault. It's just that every car is different and every rig is different, every position is different. And I don't know exactly where the camera's gonna go. I haven't necessarily been in the trailer and the car. It's a, so I had the two hero vehicles of this movie. We had a prep day for the grips to do every possible point. So they knew what it was. And they did this great thing. I wish I had a picture of it. I probably can't show it because the movie's not out, but um, we took out the back seat of this old 1960s station wagon and they put a, a slider where the seat was and they put two Mitchell head trucks on it. This is, we came up with this in that rehearsal day because the key giver was like, I bet you we could get two cameras back there. So you know how you do the back seat overs in a car? Yeah. So yeah. I had this slider with two rotating offsets so I could put two cameras in the back of this car. The actors could drive it themselves and I would sit in the back with the cameras checking exposure and being there. And, the, and I could adjust in and out if I needed to or lean over a little bit. And we wouldn't have learned that had we not done a prep day for that, all those car rigs. Yeah, that's amazing. That's, uh, that's great. I, th I find that to be, um, touch on kind of an interesting thing is like each project is gonna have its own demands. And so with the limited prep time that you have, you have to kind of fight for what the, what the thing you know you need is. And for you, you knew that it was that, that car day, you know, like for me on, I did this movie mouthpiece and one of our prep days at um, White's with the camera was prepping all these sort of like things I wanted to throw in front of the camera because I wanted to kind of break up these people's faces and do all this stuff with it. And I, that was important to me. So I knew that that would take so much time on the day. When you start doing that and putting like these little things in front of the camera, trying to mount it, you know, it's like hours pass and people are like, what are you doing? And you're like, I just want to get this prism in here. You know, it's like, so I kind of did knew that that was a, important to me and spent a day in prep doing that. Um, yeah. I think there's a bunch of questions here. Um, that one what, that's interesting to me is doing a stunt scene and having to board it and having the stunt team kind of um, dictate how you're gonna shoot it. So for me, uh, you know, stunts and fights haven't always been my strongest place where I come from and, it, and they're not the kind of movies that I watch. I don't watch a lot of action sequences and stuff like that. So, which I think is like nice because the way I want to approach those scenes isn't always like the typical, like, here's where you hide the punch. Here's where that comes in. So I try to work with them knowing that I need their advice on how to hide stuff, but I also yeah. want to approach it a certain way and then give them that challenge of, you know what, I want to do it in this shot. How can we make it happen? I know this isn't the typical way that, you, that the fight scene would work, but how can we make that work? Um, and a lot of those actually like mouthpiece and firecrackers and some of those um, indie films that had fights and stunts in them, we did uh, both films 
rehearsals with the stunt coordinator and with a camera, whether it was like a 5D or something, um, and kind of pre vis that out so that I could know that I would be happy with it and not be like forced into someone telling me how to shoot it on the day. Right. I I, ha I, I know that this experience too. I could, it's very useful. I, stunt people are so knowledgeable because they get to do that stuff in different versions every day and they're always thinking about it and it's very useful. And I'm always interested to learn from them. I think it's very good. They are so diligent in rehearsing and I think that's great too, but sometimes they will do a previs of a stunt and then they'll cut it together and then they'll show up and say, okay, this is how we'll do it. And you're kind of like, oh, this is not really in the visual language and it's a bit, you know, uh, and they, and sometimes, occasionally, um, it does start to feel as though the camera work is uh, set up to show the stunt rather than to show the experience and the stunt is just part of it. So you do have to um, kind of negotiate that a little bit and work with the stunt people and sort of say, okay, well, try to sort of guide it into another place that works for you. Um, but. Uh, sometimes you get that chance and sometimes you don't, but it, sometimes, yeah, stunt people will come in and say, here's the sort of shots for it, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's different every time. It's that diplomacy. Yeah, yeah it's uh, with firecrackers. It was an interesting one because we sort of tried in the rehearsal for me because the film was very loose in a certain way. I mean, we shot loose and everything, but there was a looseness to it and there was me kind of moving with them and I was very close to them with the camera. So in the rehearsal, we sort of tried uh, a version of it where I was just like loosely going and then I was like ah, I'm missing all right. the places and showing all the gaps in this fight you know mm. so I did need that stunt coordinator to kind of be like this is the spot and and then we'd pick where the spots were to kind of get us there and still keep it in the visual style um and, yeah and part of the prep process is is exactly that. Like I said, that movie with that big ending in the dark in this house uh, I did last year. Um, we did stunt rehearsals um, in those studio clubs. We had to studio build a two story house inside. Um, and so we did stunt rehearsals with the actors prior to the day, just to make sure everybody was comfortable. I knew how it was going to go down because there's stunt rehearsals, the stunt performers do, then the actors come in and they have certain limitations or ideas, and then you have to adapt as well. So it's a constant evolution of how to put those things together. Um, all right, well, I, this is a good place to start for start getting into maybe like some technical stuff too, right? Like cameras and yeah. what have you. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. I uh i'm just gonna I'll, maybe i'll quickly screen share this thing for a second oh yeah because we were kind of talking about it so this is going to be like a very boring thing to look at but i'll quickly sort of like show people what i do um doo -doo -doo -doo. uh there we go so can you see that i don't know uh, yeah. So this was a big one I did for Clifton Hill, and I do this on um, every project that I work on pretty much. Uh, part of it is that I have a terrible memory and I really like writing things out again and again and kind of like knowing what the scenes are. So I'll do the scene, the interior, exterior, description, day and night, a little synopsis so I can keep track of what the scene is. And then I'll just do like brief notes about things for each department. And I find it helpful because I don't like dividing up my departments too much because I feel like it's important to everybody, you know, if I'm just focusing on like one lighting thing, it's like, I kind of want to remember why I had a general idea about something or whatever. So this is something I do. It's really like time consuming and uh, <laughs> not always the most efficient, but I, I mm -hmm. find it kind of like a nice way for organizing. And then I'll share that with my key grip uh, gaffer, and the camera team and I'll put it in a Dropbox. It's usually evolving throughout the project. I don't know how often they look at that stuff. They might just like be like, yeah, thanks. And like throw it to the side. Um, I know the camera team often will kind of look at it. There's not usually a lot of camera notes, but at least it kind of gives them at the beginning of the production, like, oh, that's a steady cam day. That's a zoom, right. that's a, you know, this filter, that thing. And it kind of gives people yeah. a little heads up on that. Yeah, that's part of the, that prep stuff too is figuring out you'll get a lot of questions and from the producers and from people scheduling and from your department heads 
you know, when do we need certain pieces of equipment, daily equipment, you know, what is in that? And so you leave that, you, you have to hand that off because you have to come up with those things that you need or those ideas in collaboration with those people, but then those other people have to schedule it. So it's nice to have a document like that so they can sort of see the ideas behind it and, and go along with it. Um, that's great. I have, I've always tried to do some things like that, but it, I've never got it as organized as yours. So I'm gonna steal that from you. <laughs> Well, I was like trying to get it into Excel so that I could like reorganize it based on locations mm. and stuff, but I don't actually even know how to use Excel. So I just do it in like a Word document, but um, you know, there's lots of room to expand. And I feel like there's probably a lot more um, tools these days to like do things like this and do breakdowns uh, easier than, than mine where I'm writing out every single thing, you know? Yeah, a friends of mine, uh, some of them have used different uh, apps on their iPads and feel have great success with that. I've sort of tried all those things, but it, you know, as with everything, there's so much time spent learning new technologies. Uh, sometimes it's just it's just a lot to sort of try and wade through, um, especially if you're in the throes of trying to prep the movie and let alone kind of figure out how to use uh, pages or something. <laughs> it just happened, to me. It happened to me last year. <laughs> Um, there's a bunch of questions coming in. They're kind of like, maybe not where we're at, but let's see. So James is asking about diversity and crew um, and hiring, I guess, is what that is, if it affects us. Um, well, I, when you crew a film um, in town or out of town, I suppose, with people you haven't worked with before, do you, do you, how do you sort of... For me, I know I, I, I think I call you or you call me. I think we've had those conversations trying to sort of know, okay, who have people worked? If, my advice out there for people uh, everywhere, even cinematographers, everybody in all cruises, this is all about, not all about, but it's a lot about people. Like if I know that somebody's worked with Catherine, I, I, that's something I know. The credits, I don't necessarily know much about, but a relationship with people and a, and a working. So it's, you know, it's important to, um, on resumes and things to have people's names of who those people are, because I will look at them and be like, okay, well, I, I don't know anything about these movies, but I know that person and that's comforting. So that's, that's always useful for me in terms of how I sort of choose to work with people. Yeah, I definitely am uh, kind of calling people I know, even out of town, um, for commercials especially, I find like you're going to a place and you really, you know, you don't, there's not the time or the process of interviewing crew necessarily, and you're relying on PMs and producers to kind of crew up for you sometimes. So sometimes what that is for me is just like calling um, another DP that I know has worked there and be like, is this person? Yeah, exactly. Uh, for me, a lot of like the crewing comes from um, personality and like a vibe because especially like, you know, a TV series, you're gonna spend so much time with these people. And yeah. for me, it's really about feeling like I can mesh with somebody and that they're gonna understand me. I'm not necessarily the most loud person on set. So I kind of need to know that people are listening to me in a way that's not me having to like yell or, or assert myself in a certain way. Um, the diversity, question is interesting. I find, I mean, being a woman, there's something that I've found happening with some of my crews lately. Um, and I think I saw it on, on, um, on Anne a little bit, but like the guys that I hired, the key group and gaffer, I feel like they were actively kind of looking for dailies that were women um, to come on set because, you know, G and E are like, it's a lot of dudes. And, uh, I, it's nice to find other people to bring into that fold. Um, so I think, I think just me being me, people kind of tend to try to bring other uh, people into the mix, knowing that it will make a healthier environment. Um, I try to find a balance and, and bring in people. Um, I think there's like something great for finding like newer people who are really keen as well to learn from some of the older, more seasoned mm -hmm. people. I try to find those older, more seasoned people who are open to teaching as well and being patient yeah. and not um, getting too stuck in a certain way. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I, I, um, I, I look for people who are keen 
not the I, I'm not looking for an enormous giant resume or experience or all these things. I'm looking for people who are keen and paying attention and who because uh, it's that attitude that is going to let us get us all of us through it. And that's how I uh, want to be. I want to be a person who's if we can all be around for those hours that we are. So I, it's, it's a lot about personality. And so that's why oftentimes you sort of calling other people and saying, hey, you work with that person, how are they? And a lot, you know, nine times for 10, it's always like, oh, they're great. It's a great, it's a good thing. And, and that's just a comfort because it's difficult to work with people you don't necessarily know yet, so. Yeah, and you know, and I'm a big, I'm a big collaborator, but at the end of the day, you're the one that's making those decisions. So, you know, especially as we kind of move up in our career, there's an element of like, I become, um, you become more reliant on some of those crew members. For me, you know, doing Anne, the last season of Anne with the Need, they, you know, there were a lot bigger, there were some bigger things that aren't my daily, like low budget film setups. Um, so that crew, I needed to rely on them for some of their technical knowledge, yeah. but work with them so that it wasn't like um, them just telling me how to do it. You know, I, because I still want to come in with what I want and the style I want. So I take the principles that I know and I explain to them and then they're kind of helping me with the technical, like specifically some of the rigging of studios. Like we, mm -hmm. you know, that's not something where I'm coming to them with a plan and like a full on overhead because I just don't have the best, you know, I, I can give ideas, but a key grip is going to know better how to sort of like hang a light, have a pulley system, have a bounce that, yeah. To move back and forth in the grid you know all those things are not coming straight from me to be like you know i want you to do it exactly this way um mm -hmm. you know so on a show like that again we had time in prep they had a, the key grip and gaffer had about a month of prep kind of um setting up the studio and then i would kind of keep coming in and checking in with them how to change uh things around how to get a feeling out of it without yeah telling them exactly how to do it um and that's me relying on them as well right mm -hmm. which was which was great it was like such a nice experience but some of you know the the like triangle of quality time and money um yeah some, some of that comes from you know having some money so that that you have equipment um means that you know you can change things and that you have those resources that you don't have to prep as specifically and as hard as you might have to in a feature, an indie, a stretched budget kind of way where you kind mm -hmm. of need to know exactly what you need to have, every piece of gear, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of, it's interesting because I came from some smaller movies where they're asking you early on to give a gear list and all that kind of stuff and I would sort of do that and then I got one of my first bigger jobs and that question came up so i gave this gear list i was like okay i'll do a gear list up and then my gaffer was like huh i've never had a dp do my equipment list before and i was like oh luckily she was a friend of mine so i was like oh, okay well let's you know work on it together but um it would you know it's interesting sort of moving through and getting into larger crews especially or bigger movies where you do i do i have definitely learned to sort of ask more questions about hey i was thinking this what do you think yeah because i did i did that on the last movie with this huge exterior house on fire big valley and i was like what do you think i was thinking we'd put a lift over there and a lift over there my gaffer went nah we'll put a lift there one there we'll have two over there and we'll have one over here and i was like okay all right at least then <laughs> You know, and also, and also trying to be conscious of the producers too, because if I said I yeah. need six things, and then the gaffer goes, "Well, that guy thinks he needs six things," so you, you build the team, and he was willing to go the line, and he knew more about it than necessarily I did, because, you know, he's, he's, you know, decades long career doing specifically that, and I have so many things to purvey. So yeah. it's nice. I just it's nice to find to that. Sometimes your crew on bigger things will think a little bigger than you, which is kind of nice, and they might expand your mind of it a little bit. But also, yeah, yeah. I'm cognizant yeah. because sometimes, like I found with with Anne, sometimes they would be having my back because I'm not there prepping necessarily on a show like that. We were shooting. I shot every episode, so after like the second episode, I was on set. I wasn't really prepping. So my key grip and gaffer were going to the tech scouts and they'd come back and give me notes and they'd have, you know, these plans. And there's an element of like me going, I don't need all that stuff. 
Um, yeah. Sometimes you do, and sometimes you need to be prepared for it all. But I also don't want to be the person who has like six lifts and then gets there and goes, can you turn off like five of those? And I just need that one. Because I still, again, it's like taking the principles of what I've learned from what I've done and putting those into a bigger thing. Like people ask all the time about like, how do you do a night exterior in the woods where there's no lights? And it's yeah. like, I'm, I feel like every DP always is struggling with it. Cause it's just like, it, you don't want it to look fake but for my style. I want there to be a naturalism to it. And so even with like the biggest budget, I'd find sometimes being like, that's not, it doesn't look good enough. Like you still have to yeah, take yeah. the lighting principles and apply them yeah. because just cause you have a giant like moon box off of a 200 foot crane doesn't mean you're gonna like what that looks like. Yeah. Do you do, do you do many lighting diagrams for that kind of stuff? Like do you get maps out? I sometimes will take Google earth and like uh, pull up a picture I think I have an example here. Like I did a movie a couple of years ago where, well, it's not up, but anyway, it just I just scan Google Earth, find the location, and then I'll print it, and then I'll start drawing on it. Do you do things like that, like your lighting diagrams for exteriors? I don't do it as much for exteriors. I, I guess I do, but maybe I haven't done the Google Earth version. That's a good idea. I just do like the very bad uh, scrawly drawing that I do. Do you draw storyboards or draw things out for yourself? I'm a terrible uh, drawer. <laughs> I've always, I sh that's what I should be doing in these days. Is actually, <laughs> yeah, I own drawing from the, which I can't even remember what side of the brain uh, I should be doing that. I've always wanted to, to be able to do that better. Um, no, I don't draw story, but I draw little sketches a little bit. I learned a little bit about, you know, just sort of shapes and that kind of stuff. Um, I've had storyboards drawn. Um, I did for a while use a previous program way back in the day, but it was very, very, very time consuming. Um, uh, so, yeah. Sorry, trying to keep up these questions. It's good. I, I love it. Um, in terms of equipment, stuff like that, with the lighting guides, a lot of times you get that time with uh, your gaffer and your key grip and your bests to uh, on the tech scout is very valuable doing a tech scout and talking about these big ideas and talking out different ideas for it. And that's when, that's when generally you would hand off, they would then take over the management part of that equipment coming in and out and making sure they have it for specific days as things change. I mean, I remember back in the day when I was younger, I would kind of manage on indie movies. You would be the person managing Okay, that day got switched. Oh, don't forget, we need the you need those extra, you know, HMIs for that day. But generally, you'll hand that off to your crew. Um, I mean, always you would, but I, I do remember those versions of that and having to sort of sort of trust that okay, you guys have it now, and it's so such a relief not to have to be worried about that. I did. It was something I found to be like the most uh, like a big learning thing from doing uh, TV was how much of that was taken off my plate and i think i was like tentative in the first couple episodes like still being like you guys know we need this thing on this day uh you know tomorrow that's coming up like do you have that camera thing do you you know trying to yeah. constantly like get information from my crew to make sure they knew and it's like yeah. they always knew they had it all yeah. like the camera team had gear when we needed it and if i'd mentioned it they locked it in, written it on a calendar, had it all yeah. scheduled, called Panavision, had already organized it. Um, the gaffer and key grip already knew all that. Like, it was funny, I kind of let go of that at a certain point, which I needed to do doing, you know, 10 episodes in a row for six months. You need to like take some of that uh -oh. off your plate and rely on your crew because yeah. you don't want to burn out either, right? And just trying to yeah. micromanage all of that isn't a, isn't a good approach, so. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I, a great crew. They'll come up to you on the Monday on a week and say, "Hey, here's the outlook for the week. Just want to check in with you before they start shipping stuff in." Uh, it's really that's really useful to have because if you've handed it over to them and they're owning it for that. Um, I have a question. This is interesting to me. Just to sort of slightly switch tack. Okay. Um, how? This is. I love this question. Uh, how do you pick an aspect ratio and then therefore lenses? Uh, I feel like it's a conversation that usually happens with the director pretty early on, I would say. Um, 
sometimes like it just screams out to me and other times a little bit less so uh yeah. firecrackers we we were like we talked about it a lot um you know that was the movie that we wanted to feel very real you wanted to feel like you're in the moment uh so we immediately like can't ruled out that we would do widescreen because we we're like it's too cinematic it's right, too right, right. showy it feels too too slick or something you know so then we were like do we do four three and then it was like sort of similar like felt too yep. gimmicky or too like cool or something so we just we went to the and we're like this is the most real feeling in a way or just less um overly stylized i guess but i don't feel that so, way for everything i missed you said you went 185 eventually yeah yeah uh, yeah that's so interesting i i um it's almost like some sort of feeling I have, unless a director has, I've had directors, and this is great, because then you're kind of like, okay, good. Um, you sort of know, even though you're kind of like, well, I wish we could talk about it. Who would say, we're going to shoot anamorphic. And you're like, okay. Uh, but, you know, that's fine. Um, and that dictates your aspect ratio, essentially. Um, but um, sometimes you get directors who care, and sometimes they kind of don't care. And so then it's up to you as to choose an aspect ratio or think about it. And I, it depends. It's so interesting to me choosing that because oftentimes it's, uh, I just want something new and exciting because my last job I did 185 and I want to do widescreen this time. You know, things like all these little things seep <laughs> in your brain and you go, or you think, oh, it's going to be, uh, you know, I want to do something, um, you know, interesting or you want to do something cinematic or all these sorts of things. Um, but I, I yeah, it's such an interesting choice to me because it, it seems to carry so much weight, just the shape of that screen. I've always been interested. And what about lenses? How do you go about that? Do you have a set? Do you do you have a set of lenses that you uh, they are your kind of like favorites, or at least maybe like right now are your favorites? No, I don't. I mean, I feel like every project is kind of different. In the past, I've done a lot with super speeds, and that comes from like low budget world to be honest but I then grew to love them um because they used to be lenses that you could just kind of get for real cheap which is kind of changed I think now a little bit but um and they're small you know so something like yeah. firecrackers where it's me and, it, and it's handheld the build of the camera is really important to me uh and this the size and the weight of it was important there and that kind of helped with that they were softer older all that kind of stuff um but it's always different like clifton hill we started we were going to shoot on film then we couldn't shoot on film we so we started uh exploring different versions of anamorphic and um albert the director didn't really want um you know like weirdness to the anamorphic he didn't really want um bendy the aberrations. Side or, yeah, or yeah. aberrations or the out of focus and in the end we went with master anamorphics which are like so clean they did they oh. felt like not like me at all but i kind of loved it and it and it was like yeah. a new thing to explore um so yeah i don't know i mean every project is kind of different and i usually do a day uh, at a camera house lens testing yeah i uh I'm the sort of same. I find it so interesting that choice and and always it's what did I do last time? What am I chasing? I'm chasing something different or and you know, and you're also like what is trendy it always seeps into your head too. You know, anamorphic got very trendy there for a long time and now it's kind of back. Uh sort of you're also like what's brand. available from rental houses and like what can you afford that too. sometimes is a question to weigh into it. Yeah. The, it's uh, there's a question earlier from I think from one Brendan Stacy about um, like how much time do you do you carve out for technical prep? Uh, yeah, there it is. How much do you reserve for technical prepping, prep and testing? Uh, it's part of this conversation because very early on, I'll start talking to a camera house about a job and talk about certain ideas for lenses and cameras. Um, and um, it's it's great if you have a camera house that you know. And I've done a lot of work with um, Sim Digital and Craig Milne, and I've done a lot of work with Panavision, Jerry Papernick there. And and those are the people that I'll call first and just be like, hey, I got this thing. 
uh, talk to me. Like, what lenses do you have? What uh, I was thinking this. What else is comparable? Like, what? Are, and I so I spread the collaboration of that almost that choice to the rental house because then they're involved and they'll pull something from somewhere and then it automatically kind of adds that what's available kind of part to that figuring out. Cause I don't want to go in and be like, I want to shoot these. And they're like, no, ain't got none. You're like, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I, I, to answer Brendan's question in a way, I start very early on in technical stuff. I don't get to the testing stuff generally till much later. It depends if I want to test lenses early if I'm trying to make a decision, but um, throughout, peppered throughout prep, I'm definitely looking at a lot of technical different things based on what I know I need to test and then I'll get into some testing. We'll talk about that a little later on. Um, but I'm the same way, lenses, they're kind of different every time and I'm sort of fascinated to uh, try them and sort of learn them and get frustrated by them and then kind of like love them and then kind of go, oh, okay, it was fine. And, <laughs> about yeah we should have like um hawk um the the, the anamorphic on mouthpiece and they there were things about them that i totally loved and then there'd be other days where i was just like oh that spot that never is in focus that's right yeah. your faces right now and you know and you kind of like go through the waves of learning them and and how you want to use them and you know that's part of our job is figuring out how those tools can be used, but um, yeah, yeah. yeah and I, on Anna, it was interesting because there'd been two seasons, and they'd had different lenses on both seasons. And then I came in, and I wanted to change the camera format. So then we were like back into lens testing again, and I pulled right. all the lenses that had ever been used on any of the seasons, um, and tried them all. And then the the, the uh, sensor size is so much larger, so I couldn't use a lot of the lenses that that had been there, but I ended up going back to a lot of what was done in the first season, which was Bobby Shore. And he had, he had taken a lot of old vintage lenses and stuff that was like mucky and dirty. Yeah. So we saw those, but it was an interesting test process because, you know, having now like a 6K, we were shooting 6K, a lot which of- Which camera, would Ka which stuff. camera was it, Catherine? Uh, the DXL2. Oh, okay. So the big, yeah. the Monstro sensor, the big, the big one? Yeah. uh yeah i think so you're gonna ask me I'm gonna, oh, right. uh yeah. yeah but uh you know like there were certain lens sizes we could never get because we couldn't get them to cover the sensor right. and that again right. also like the choice of lenses like we tested out um large format lenses but in the end there was sort of a decision of like okay i can go this way which i you know some of these are nice and i like it but i can have a limited amount of lenses because of the budget versus mm. i can take all these old lenses and i can have like a lot of them <laughs> which i actually really loved and there were these lenses and you know i owe a lot of this to bobby but there were a lot of lenses that had these sort of weird characters to them so there was one 40 that like has this diagonal flare through it so anytime there's a hot spot there's just like a diagonal straight through yeah. um, which i love but it was like you don't want that every time you want a 40 so we had a second 40 and we could afford to do that because we've gone with those lenses as opposed to going mm -hmm. to you know a large format set which we would have been kind of limited in what we had to play with yeah i uh um I, it's funny, I, I sort of lenses, there's always one lens in the box I never use for some reason. It's always like what the widest, wi it's always the widest, widest one. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 do. I, I never use like those super long, I rarely use super long. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you use many zooms? Uh, yeah, I mean, mouthpiece we used, like we would actually do in camera zooms quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. I did them in Clifton Hill too. They, they didn't use as many as we do we shot. Um, I, yeah, I mean, sometimes they're good. I, I, I try to avoid, like doing TV is interesting and doing the two camera coverage where there's like a tendency for there to be the B camera and it's just on a zoom and it just like gets in there. I try to avoid that a little bit. Um, yeah. So, but you know, there's something nice about, about a zoom as well. Yeah. I, sometimes in prep, I, you get offered certain zooms and you're trying to cut. I'm usually just getting them because I want 300 mils or something. You know, I want the long for some, just yeah. for something because I need longer than whatever primes I have. 
but then there's a question of like matching those zooms to primes. So you try and do a few tests just to make sure, or, or, or sometimes if I get a, if I get a set of lenses that are, um, uh, a little bit funky and I get a zoom that's a little bit tighter or the opposite. It depends sometimes. Um, I just change my set of filters. I have this, I've, every movie I've ever done, I use Ultracron filters. That's my secret. <laughs> it's no secret to it. <laughs> For some reason, I started using Ultracon filters years ago and I just always use them and I use them in varying degrees. And if I have a, set, a lens that's a little bit sharper, I'll up the Ultracon just to take the edge off it. It doesn't do anything for aberrations, but then if I have something that's a little bit, a little too funky, I'll lighten the Ultracon. So I do do little things like that that are just psychosomatic. They're only just for me. Nobody, it's not really Nobody very much. Really. Well, I find that that's actually like often a funny thing is that sometimes you don't notice those differences in a zoom to your set of primes, even though they're like wildly different. Once it's cut into a film, sometimes you don't notice. I mean, sometimes you do, yeah. but sometimes you don't. I yeah, use a lot the, of uh, the same filters as well. Anyone that works with me will know the the glimmer glimmer glass is real. Um, <laughs> as often, assistants have come up with various names because it's very sparkly. But pretty pony, glim glam. I don't know what oh, else, wow. but <laughs> all kinds of magical magical sparkly uh, filters. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's all again, like part of the prep process is developing that look and how much you want to do that. On Clifton Hill, I was way less in that world of softening things up. Mm -hmm. um, do you, what do you do? Do you have a way of testing lenses? Do you kind of go through that a little bit or what, what is your, if do you want to see the set of lenses? Do you get a choice? Sometimes you don't get a choice. Sometimes I just, they're like, here is the set of lenses you get. And testing just means, okay, yeah, they, they function. But do you sometimes try and choose a set specific? I know Bobby does that quite heavily. Um, sort of trying to find those lenses. And sometimes you don't get time to do that in prep. No, I don't specifically. Um, no, I feel like on the show I was starting, we actually, actually went in and did a quick camera test day in the first week and uh, we might kind of dig a little further for things like that um, and find those specialty lenses but I no, generally I don't I just kind of go with the one I, I I don't know testing is like every time is a little bit different it's like that silly version that you've seen online where there's like a person sitting there and then like some Christmas lights in the background and like a candle um, I've done that version a lot. Yeah. It's usually that's usually the early test stage, right? Of like figuring out what lenses you want to use. And mm -hmm. then as you get closer to the day, I'll usually do another test day for something more specific to the show. Um, whether that's like in the camera house or not, but like with mouth mouthpiece, I was saying, like we did a day in there. Um, I can actually like show a little bit of add some stills from uh I have some stills from some tests that I did. Is it gonna let me open them? I've done that a little bit too, where you just wanna learn a little bit about different lenses somehow. It also just warms you up to the lens too. I'll go over to the camera house and prep. I occasionally do a movie where you're doing, I've done movies entirely handheld where I'll be operating just because you're that close to the actors and I'll go over and have a look at the lenses and also set the camera up so that it's ergonomic to me and small as, as I want. So, or as small as I can get it is the whole goal. Ah, oh, this is nice. So this is kind of like we were doing, I was testing some of this stuff that I knew would take a lot of time on the day. So putting these two people into the same frame and kind of messing around with their faces in various ways was, uh, oh. um, mm -hmm. not like, doesn't like me scrolling through these, but um, yeah, so that's like a very specific thing, but I knew I kind of needed to do for that movie. Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, with something like Anne, I was trying to figure out how I wanted the night to look on that show because you have a night where there's no lights, right? It's like, 1899 or whatever and there's no electricity in PEI 
So you have no motivation other than moon um, and candles. So I kind of took the camera into our sets and did some, some test days in there, going through all the colors of blue and things that I wanted and finding the right um, color temperature with the color of blue, with the mix of um, tungsten and things. So that was, you know, it's like each project figuring out what that those test days are. And obviously, it depends on the production and if they have the resources to, to do that. I think it, it's funny testing stuff, you know, um, I've done some tests in prep where uh, I did a movie last year, again, unfortunately I can't show still for it, but um, where we did, we had a lot of fire in the movie. And so I think it's kind of interesting and important to point out that uh, so I asked for a fire test day. So we did a hair makeup test and I asked that there be a couple hours set aside where I could test my flicker rigs, actual flame, test the, the, the burn gel they're going to put on the walls for the walls burning. Because I just, it's not that I didn't know, it's just that I needed to reassure myself as to what limits of exposure I'm going to get myself into. Um, so test days are about testing things to kind of learn how to do it yeah. a little bit. It's not as though we don't know, but I think it's important to realize it's like, I just was like, I haven't done fire in a long time. I haven't done fire like this in a long time. I had to do this scene where it's all dark inside this house and there's this whole sun sequence that goes from no light and then the house is on fire. So whatever I've had in there, shooting in very low level, anamorphic, and then all of a sudden the walls are on fire. So my, my sort of F, my T-stop was, you know, like two threes and two eights on these anamorphics. And then all of a sudden the fire is on and I have to rebalance all of the set to this fire because that fire is a five, six and a half, or that's where I want to be to get the exposure. I needed to learn that in prep. So I got the fire rig out and I checked different exposures and I was looking at it, graded it a little bit and I could tell where I could get to because I knew I was going to be up against this very technical thing of how do I expose this fire. So prep testing it for me is, is you're learning a bunch of stuff that you don't yet know quite exactly how you're going to do it. And kind of like, I didn't know, but I am. Yeah. Well, and knowing that you're like saving yourself that time on the day, right? You, you have the knowledge of knowing that you won't have that time to like figure that out on the day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, there was a question about using the DXL uh, and how production felt about changing. Production was fine with changing it. They didn't have any issues. It needed to be uh, 4K for Netflix. Um, otherwise, I probably would have used an Alexa. Uh, they had used Vericam, I believe, in the previous seasons. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to go into the, the post-production house, um, which was Technicolor and look at some of their footage from the previous seasons um, and just look at some of the troubles that they'd had with the exposures um, and some of the low light stuff um, and talk to the colorists about what they, you know, how that footage had dealt with, they've dealt with that footage. Um, and I kind of just decided I wanted to go a different way. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. usually like much of a red cam shooter, which the DXL is essentially a red camera, um, but I really loved it. I had a great experience with it. So. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, choosing a camera is an interesting, interesting thing too, because there's cameras you're a favorite for. But you know, I did a movie a couple of years ago where all that was available that was small enough for me to do the movie was a Red Dragon, and I had to sort of go, okay, well, I'll take that on and have to learn that a little bit, you know, because I was so used to Alexas and Alexa Minis and couldn't get one, so I was into a Red, and it's just different, little different little things about it, but. Um, you're, some, on me, for me, that priority was it being small. I couldn't have a classic Alexa with a big thing like this. I needed something that was small I could get in the backseat of the car with, et cetera, so. Yeah. Um, um, and then I know you and I have talked a lot about LUTs and it looks like Brett is, asked, is uh, bringing that up too. Brett uh, Trider, who's uh, a dear friend of ours and then a fantastic colorist, works over Technicolor, is on the line here asking about building lots and more testing. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Yeah, 
Yeah, and it's becoming more and more uh, important, I think. I mean, it always has been, but it's uh, it's such a key part of the look of a film um, that I want it dialed in at the beginning. <laughs> I want yeah. to do my final color and it not to be that far off of what we were looking at on set. Um, that's something that's kind of evolved for me and has only happened in the last few years, but uh, yeah, I did, you know, with Firecrackers, we, it was so low budget. It was like the lowest budget thing I've ever done. And we weren't gonna have a DIT. The producer was like capturing footage at the end of the night and putting it on a drive. Um, but I knew that the look was so important. So we kind of did do testing um, in prep. And then I had a, a colorist that I worked with, an onset colorist, Andrew, um, and he he kind of did uh, some some looks for me, Andrew Salky. He did some looks, and then I started using him on set. And then the first few days of production, I basically was emailing him at night, sending him stills, and being like, "Can you modify these LUTs?" So then he'd send them back. So then I had about six or seven LUTs in camera. But that all kind of came out of the initial testing, which is hard because you're not in the spaces that you're in, you're not in the lighting that you're in. So it was a little bit, that's why I kind of had to keep changing them. Um, but Brett at, at Technicolor has also been a huge help for, you know, for Clifton Hill, we did the same thing. Um, I wanted there to be a lot more green in the film. So he kind of took like a LUT that we'd used before and then added a bit more green instead of cyan. And um, yeah, the film, when we went to do the final wasn't so wildly far off of what we were looking at as dailies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's, I, I've done any number of things throughout the years in terms of onset LUTs. I eschewed them for a long time and didn't really, because I, I, I was so nervous. I wanted to just see what I was getting. Like the same as you went back in the film days, your feedback would be, now we use false colors and a lot of digital tools, but you would get prints from the lab, just work prints, and you'd get your printer lights and you'd know are you hitting the negative to a degree you think is workable for your final look? Um, and so I would get nervous about LUTs on set because uh, it was doing a bunch of things I didn't yet understand or I didn't know I couldn't get I, And so I, I, I didn't do LUTs for a long time and I would just shoot 709 because I knew it and I would always check raw or I would shoot the low contrast curve because it would just give me video space wide gamut and knowing later. Um, but then having LUTs to do your dailies is so important because I'm sure you've experienced this um, where uh, you um, you shoot the movie and then your dailies go through and they edit the movie and then you come back to the grade and you go, okay, let's get into this and then make it look dark and interesting and green and all the things. And then they're going, uh, they spent three months, the director and the, everybody's been spent three months watching the movie in just a regular seven and nine space. And they kind of go, uh, we kind of liked it how it was. And you go, oh, it's, this is just, you know, how the computer thought it should go. So now I'm very much um, uh, try and get it to be um, as close as I can in the dailies, especially on set. I'm not so worried about it that much, but uh, in the dailies, they have to go out. Um, as close as I feel they should be. Yeah, so. yeah, I agree. Um, do you do live grading? Great question. I have not. Um, I'm. I like to be. I like to be on set, next to the camera, near the action. I don't want. I don't like to be drawn away to a black tent or or not feel connected because my head works so spatially and visually that if I'm just looking at something and talking to somebody on a walk here, doing, I, so I don't live grade because then I'd be too spread out of all the things I feel I should be on top of. So I generally just work with one lot um, and it's sort of a show lot um, and I'll, it's any number of different versions of whatever I've cooked up and then I just spend the show relying on what I know rather than kind of juggling them or changing them. I get nervous about that. But it's the same as back in the old days of you were very confident. You knew 5279, 500T, you knew that film stock. So I try and rely on that. Occasionally I'll do a, 
a night LUT and I'll do a day LUT, that's it. But I'm fascinated by them. I try, I try them all. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at them. I, I steal everybody's. I yeah. ask, you know, everybody, hey, send me your kit bag. I want to see what's in there. But I still just try to do my <laughs> thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I did live grade for Anne. And because uh, I really wanted the look of the show to be what people were seeing on set. I didn't want there to be a lot of questions about that later on. Um, and I, I really enjoyed it actually. It's, it's interesting. And it's also, you know, not so prep oriented, but in terms of doing a show where you're doing something for so long, right? That was, it was like a five or six month run of shooting. Um, I knew that I wouldn't have the time at the end of the day to go onto a truck and stand there with a DIT and change everything and look at it. I just, knew myself but that by like month three i'd be like gotta go home and sleep right now um so i was doing it on set and it was super helpful it was amazing mm -hmm. oh great i i eventually i will try it um, um there's a question that keeps popping up from uh greg middleton have you ever over prepped or has your crew ever over prepped no there's no such thing as over prepping <laughs> have you ever over prepped I feel like well, I, everything is like helpful to me. Um, I can't think of what an over prepped version would be. Well, I mean, maybe Greg is saying, cause I've had this experience where you've sort of said to a crew, okay, we're going to do X, Y, Z and you show up and then they've, they've just covered the place with stuff. And you're like, actually just, you know, turn that practical on and like, uh, you know, <laughs> put a black over that window and we're done. You know, we don't need any of this stuff. So I've definitely had that where, where a crew has, but you know what, it, it's interesting. I'm always very appreciative of that because you never know, maybe we'd show up and that's what we needed to do. And what's important for everybody to know in all walks of the jobs that we do on these sets, uh, on movies, us, everybody, actors, is that there's so much work we're all gonna do that won't ever be in the movie or in the TV show. Entire roles will like uh, characters will be cut out of movies. That actor showed up and did all that work and it'd be cut out. You'll shoot entire sequences, won't use it. So sometimes you'll show up and you'll do a whole big setup, and you won't use any of it. And I think I think it's important for people to realize that you have to kind of get used to that idea and not be too precious. But yeah, I've definitely had over prepped. But it's it's I've also had people uh, over prep and save my ass too. So it's it's definitely something. Um, uh that can happen yeah it's funny i i had a hard time sometimes on and and i feel like my key grip would probably attest to it that i would feel really bad asking the grips to do a bunch of stuff that would get not used at all mm -hmm. <laughs> um and you'd be like this is our job this is what we do uh we yep. can do all the stuff and you can use none of it let's be prepared for it you know um, it's better to have it all ready than to not have it ready and to scramble to need it and not be ready for that. I agree. The same idea for it's prep in all, in all ways. Yeah. Do yeah. you, uh, there's a question here from David, do you make a prep Bible? A prep Bible? I mean, that, that, um, thing I showed you is kind of a bit of a prep Bible. Um, I do storyboards and, and overhead drawings as well. Sometimes they'll scribble things. Um, it's not necessarily like a very cohesive Bible. I guess my own notes. And depending on the project, certain projects I'll do. Uh, for some reason on Clifton Hill, I was like really very prep, prep uh, trying to be organized about it. But every day I would kind of do a new thing for the day. And part of that was just about the night before me writing it out and reminding myself. So every day I'd come with a new thing. Here's the shot list here's a little storyboard or pictures, or if I have to match to something else we've already shot, I pulled that picture and put it in there. Here's Grip mm -hmm. Electric Notes. Um, and I would do that for every single shoot day. Right. But that doesn't always happen. Yeah. I don't do necessarily Bible, but I, I have my sort of central notes. Like I said earlier, I have a, the script with all my written notes on it and I try and keep the script as close as possible so that I keep that in mind. Um, so, um i do uh what do you do much in terms of um 
Well, actually, I mean, it's less of a question. Maybe I find sometimes that uh, I'm the one sort of organizing, putting together what our camera test day will be on a, on a film specific. I don't know if in TV you get to do this much, but, and I will sort of put an email out and prep and prep to wardrobe and hair and makeup and production design and everybody who has things in front of the camera. And I'll say, you know, um, I'm going to organize a, a camera test is, is so that we can photograph some things and learn a bit. And then on a film, I'll generally organize to get it projected and we can all go and watch and see what it means and see how the colors represent. So I'm organizing all that stuff for hair and makeup tests, um, which I think is super important because also it gets everybody kind of in front of the camera. So it's not like like I need to get used to having the camera around because I've just spent six weeks in an office and I need to sort of like get kind of you know, stretch, stretch these muscles a little bit. Do you do, do you do, do you find yourself doing a lot of hair makeup, uh, wardrobe test stuff? Um, yeah, I mean, they're usually requested or there's certain, you know, often there'll be a specific item that a wardrobe person wants to see in front of a uh, camera. Um, so there's usually like a few hours carved out in a test day for that, for sure. Um, I try to give like a couple different lighting scenarios as well. Like I have a light mat, so it's just like if that's in the testing space where you can see a side light and see a top light and kind of get an idea. Because, you know, makeup right. can also break a thing if it looks bad or too clear or whatever on those lenses. You want to know what that's going to look like. So I find that interesting. Um, an interesting like firecrackers note about prep and camera was is a... Uh, they were really like doing a lot of workshopping for that film. So they would, the director and actors were uh, basically a year in advance. So when you talk about the triangle of time and money, this movie had like zero dollars money pretty much. Like it was a telefilm, um, talent to watch film. And uh, they, but so they made up for it with the time, time and prep. And they were um, doing workshops and improv sessions to build their characters and doing all these mm. things together um over over a period of a year and then at a certain point i think it was a few months before we started shooting they let me come into those rehearsals and those those workshops um, and part of that was like the actors were not really professional actors they were kind of new some of them non-union some of right. them hadn't acted before and so part of that process was like me getting i wanted to shoot that with a pretty wide lens that was pretty close to people uh, and it yeah. was something I was weighing in my mind because I was like, these are people that aren't really used to having a camera near them. And now I want to be really near them. So it was, again, choosing the prep, what's important in prep. And I knew that it was important for me to like get in there with them. So they got used to it. So it wasn't yeah. us showing up the first day and being like, here's a camera in your face. Now do the thing that you guys have been doing. So I just like had borrowed a C300 and I started going, and we weren't even doing scenes from the movie. They were just doing like these kind of character workshops and we were sort of, mm -hmm. I was just getting in there and getting them used to a camera being in their face, which um, was cool. It was like a really fun experience actually and really like informed us when we went to camera. It really, it really gets everybody kind of warmed up. I've done, I've done similar things, you know, especially with uh, kids. Yeah, you know, just the non-actors and kids, which I, I've had a, that experience of trying to just make sure everybody kind of gets used to that because everything you shoot on day one is going to be in the movie. <laughs> um, yeah. I've had to do a lot of tests. I'll screen share a little bit of thing here. This is from, we had um, different ages. Um, we had a different age. So we sometimes you, you get a lot of tests because you want to test to make sure the aging is is uh, correct. So this is from this is from Madi who did in Newfoundland. This is this is uh, you and um, Ethan Hawk showed up uh, on day one of photography. He hadn't been in town, so we we took a session a, a, a couple of minutes away, and he showed up with his young look, uh, and we had to shoot some of that. And then and then he showed up, and we had to do his sort of like you know 10, 15 years older, just because we didn't want to have any of those discussions about how the aging of that would go. And this was great for me because all of a sudden we're, we're actually testing on a set in the style of lighting that I want to do. I was um, going to say, are these, are. Um, 
And so these are still from tests, not from the film. From the test, not from the film, no. So the wardrobe wanted to see about some of these colors here. And we did a couple other tests. I just have these two stills here, but um, um, but it, I'll see if I can pull up another one. This might crash my computer. We'll see if it crashes. <laughs> um, nice. For that category. film, do you guys have, did you build that house that you were in? That's an interesting thing. We started that film, that little tiny house. It was a, a small um, 13 by 13 house, no electricity and one window about the side, like about two foot by one foot and a door. Oh no, there's another window. There's two windows and a tiny window. So there's one window and one door with a window in it. And it, that was it, no electricity, so no lights. And so, we had this whole discussion about how we were going to build it and we couldn't build it in the studio. It was brought up and was like, now we can't, we're not going to, because then you have to put all this green screen and all this stuff outside, but the door goes straight outside. And then the actors can't, how are they going to go from inside to outside? So in prep, we were looking at it and we found a great location. We said, we're going to build it in situ and work inside and outside of it. But we went through so many iterations of, of how we're going to build that house because we didn't know how small, if we could manage being that small. So we made parts of the the walls of the house that we could open like doors, just in case we were in trouble. Never used them, not once. It was really interesting, but we did all this planning. We was like, okay, that corner is specific. That's where she does her painting. We'll put a hinge door there just in case we need to get back there, get the camera in, all that kind of stuff. And we never did it. First of all, we just didn't have time. And second of all, it was nice not to have to do it, but it was ready to go, but we never used it. Yeah, it's a, that's a funny thing I find often for me with sets. I don't like the walls coming out. I like the restrictions of being in there. And I like, yeah. again, coming usually from a place of, of naturalism. So I don't love being outside of the set because it feels like you're outside of a set and it feels like set. Um, yeah. But it is an interesting thing because it also can be very useful. Um, yeah, with, with production design, it's interesting too. The, um, I found with Anne, it was amazing, like our production designer, I was constantly being sent these amazing packages of basically mm -hmm. the designs for each new location, any key furniture that was going to be in there, any textiles that were going to be in there, any um, lamps, windows, and the window heights, the set heights, anything that was outside um, the studio height that we were in, all the specifications, which uh was incredible and like is not something you get on an indie film necessarily um but it was a really really cool thing yeah it's great when the, you get all the drawings and then you know being on that film with Maudie, we could sit there and we built a model and we would say hey wouldn't it be great if we maybe made the house a foot bigger in each direction nobody will notice but they'll give us a little extra space and you can be a part of that conversation or you know, set drawings that show up and say, I'm going to need a little bit more space here. Can the ceiling be higher or lower? Yeah, or you know of a specific shot that you want to do and so they can kind of work around what your requirements are yeah. for that. Yeah, exactly. All right, we're, we're pretty close to a two hour mark here. Let's just quickly maybe answer a few of these questions because they're great questions and I wish we had more time to keep talking about it, but we don't want to keep up going on it. Uh, Doug says, speaking of LUTs, how heavily do you depend on onset monitors? Me personally, I still use a light meter, not for exposure, but more for consistency, because as the sun's going down, the monitor stays pretty bright and I need to sort of measure it. So I, I use it to just make sure, okay, I know what this is rather than having to judge it from a monitor where the environment uh, messes me up. So I don't rely on monitors that much. I do a lot more raw or log C false color measurements. Do you, do you find yourself um, I do a little bit, but I also still am looking at raw and false colors and waveforms. Um, but I do to a certain extent, you know, on Anne, we had a, we had the two monitors for our live grade and at a certain point, the monitor kind of like shifted in color and I could always, I'm like, I like the color on this monitor, but not on that one. So we had to get things recalibrated yep. because you were starting to really notice it shifting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's important to kind of look at all the tools and not just rely on the monitor. When you're operating yeah. yourself, it's, uh, you know, sometimes it's almost easier for me to monitor the false colors and stuff when I'm operating myself because you're just like pressing that button as opposed to having to yeah. ask somebody to press a button or pull something up for you. 
Uh, exactly. I do the same. I have it all set up my same way. And I have a my I have this handle I had made by shape. Uh, this made me a bracket to so I can hold the camera with one hand handheld and it balances rather than out, out here like this. And I can put my elbow here, similar to your your uh, sound blanket <laughs> thing that you get to triangulate, but it means I have this hand free. So I can check my false colors. I can adjust the exposure. Maybe I can focus. I can do all these other things. I can push a door out of the way as I go through. So I'm not, I'm not just two hands like this. Yeah, I need uh, to get onto that. <laughs> oh, it's always changing, you know. Yeah. Any lighting sources, setups you have at the ready at all times? That's a question from Josh. Lighting sources at the ready. I don't know. What do you think? What do you do? <laughs> I wanted you to have like, oh, that's what you do. Um, I don't know. You know, I usually nowadays will have stuff on standby. Like if we're doing a night scene and I've planned it out, I'll usually have like a sky panel or something on standby in case I want to bounce it into the ceiling for like a slight little bit of fill so I can monitor those levels. Um, yeah, there's not like one go to though. I feel like everything's a little little different. I definitely, um, for day interiors, um, and it's changing a little bit now, but I would always say, because it gets me out of trouble really quickly, um, it gets the boom operator in trouble very quickly, is that I'll have a HMI source for nearby. So if I need a quick source somewhere really quickly, I can put it across the room and fire a little bounce just to lift up a corner emphasize a window um but of course the when the boom goes through it it's a pain in the ass but um that's probably my go-to uh, astera tubes are becoming a very very common thing for me i never really was a big led fan but now that's starting to get much the super i did a commercial last fall where it was i just had astera tubes and it was all steady cam and it was just me with two astera tubes like lightsabers walking with these actors through all these spaces it's very bizarre. Yeah, definitely with commercials and music videos, I find them to be very, very handy. Yeah. Um, all right, what do you think here? Uh, these are all great questions, everybody. We really appreciate them. I'm sorry we didn't have time to sort of get to them. I hope everybody had a good uh, couple hours now uh, listening to us <laughs> talk about this. Um, Maybe we should, we should wrap it up again. Thanks to everybody at the CSC for, for having us. I think this is a great initiative. Um, next week, uh, Craig, Bleske, Craig Bleske and Neville Kidd are going to be talking about large format cameras. Just so save those questions for next week because they'll know a lot more about it because they did uh, Umbrella Academy together. So that's next week, same time, same place. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Follow CSC, Instagram, Facebook. <laughs> Um, and you can I, follow you can follow Catherine on Instagram at at brutes b r u t e s. What's yours, Guy Godfrey? You you have just the real name. Yeah. Just yeah. Just yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, one other thing I should just quickly mention this got sent to me. If everybody's up for more of this today at three o'clock Eastern time. Uh, Justin Lovell and Michael Yari Davidson, Justin Lovell who runs Frame Discreet and Michael Yari Davidson who's a cinematographer in, in Toronto. They have an Instagram live talk over on the Lyft channel. Uh, Lyft is the liaison of independent filmmakers in Toronto and um, they're doing a talk about motion picture film scanning uh, starting in five minutes. So just to plug that for those guys because um, uh, they'll probably have a lot of interesting things to say there as well. Um, so yeah. Cool. Nice chatting yeah. with you. <laughs> yeah, same to you. Um, hopefully we can all get back to prepping <laughs> uh, soon. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, it's good. Thank you for uh, chatting. It was very interesting to hear. I, I, I still have more questions. I will always have questions. So I'll, we'll always keep in touch about it. Yeah. yeah ask about things. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Take care.